Mike Potter is the son of Jess Potter, who followed the path of many of NASCAR's early stars. Struggling during the Great Depression, Jess learned to work on cars at a local junkyard. Once he got behind the wheel, he was arrested for bootlegging. The judge gave him the option of serving a jail sentence or joining the army. He chose the latter, applying his skills as a mechanic to the war effort. This steered Jess toward racing, and in 1954 he started his own team. He hired a driver, but when that driver didn't show up, someone else offered to pay $10 for a license. This driver was Brownie King, who like Jess was born in Johnson City, Tennessee. And when I ran back down there with the license in my hand, Paul Goldsmith was sitting in the car, said King. They were getting ready to start the race, and Jess said, here he comes. So Paul jumped out, and I jumped in. On December 2nd, 1956, King and Potter made their first cup start together at the Concord, North Carolina Speedway. With Potter serving as crew chief, King finished 11th in a field of 25. This was the first of 301 combined cup starts that Potter Racing made across nine seasons with several different drivers. The team never scored a victory, but did score four top fives. The best finish came with a driver named George Green, a U.S. Army sergeant who was stationed in Germany when he wasn't racing. On June 30, 1957, at the Jacksonville, North Carolina dirt track, Green finished fourth behind Buck Baker, Jim Paschal, and Tiny Lund. Also joining the team as driver was Ken Hunley, who changed his name to Bob because his health insurance wouldn't cover him if he raced. Bob's only start came at Richmond on June 21, 1959, when he ran 13th as Green's teammate. Jess's two-car operation became even more necessary in 1960, when he hired a 19-year-old Leadfoot named Buddy Baker. Baker tore up so much equipment that they had to use the winnings from his teammate, Paul Lewis, to rebuild Baker's car. Though Baker made just seven starts for Jess Potter, he was forever grateful for the opportunity. But he told me if it wasn't for my daddy, he never would have had a racing career, said Mike Potter. He said Buck couldn't afford him, and those races he ran for daddy got him noticed. Jess gave his team everything he had. To supplement his income, he worked a full-time job at the Rainbow Bakery, and on weekends was so tired driving back home to Tennessee that every five minutes, he and Brownie King would switch off driving the hauler. By 1965, Jess handed over his team to owner-driver E.J. Trevette, who would go on to have one of the best seasons of his 13-year career. By that time, Jess's sons Mike and Gary were just about old enough to race themselves. Gary would compete in the Pikes Peak Hill Climb, made a few starts in the early years of what is today the NASCAR Xfinity Series, and even worked for Hendrick Motorsports. Despite this, Gary never quite reached the Cup Series. Instead, he'd serve as a mechanic for Mike's bid to get there. Like his father, Mike Potter served in the military. Born on the 4th of July, 1949, he was in the U.S. Marine Corps for four years and completed a tour in Vietnam in 1967. Back stateside, he worked as a tow truck driver at Naves Auto Salvage and raced when he could. His first green flag came in 1971 at the Sportsman Speedway in Johnson City where he flipped his car five times. It was another accident, ironically, which got Mike into NASCAR. Out on the highway during his day job, Mike rescued a man named Charlie McKay who was pinned under an overturned car. Mike pulled the car off him with his truck and from the friendship that resulted, McKay offered to build his race cars and serve as crew chief. I don't have to do it, but I want to, said Mike of racing. I would like to make a living at it someday. Mike's first Cup Series start came on April 1st, 1979. That date should sound familiar. This was the Southeastern 500 at Bristol, the first of Dale Earnhardt's 76 career victories. That race happened to be at Mike's home track. He wasn't fast enough in the first round of qualifying, logging a lap of 102.745 miles per hour, but in the second round, his number 76 Miller Chevrolet picked up nearly two full miles per hour, 104.632, placing him 28th in the field of 30. He finished 16th, still under power at the finish. I like to run Bristol, he said the following year. It's hard on you, but you feel like you were driving the car instead of the car driving you. Bristol is a driver's track. It has a lot of physical involvement. It's more like sportsman racing. 
Mike made another three races that year, and also finished sixth in the late model Sportsman Series standings at the King Sport International Speedway. The money situation is the biggest problem, he said on March 28, 1980. You run like the money gives you a chance to run. Engine problems are the biggest worry. Mike also talked about operating with limited spare parts. Really, we never have enough of anything, he said. In 1980, Mike planned to run in just five races, hoping to compete for Rookie of the Year the following season. It pays extra money to be a contender, he said. By March 9th at the Rockingham Speedway, he was already entrusted as a relief driver. Out after 21 laps with a cracked piston, Mike then took over for an ill Terry Labonte and brought home the car in 10th. Driving for Billy Hagen went a long way toward Mike's goal of driving for another team. It's a business now, he said of racing. They're in it for the money, not in it for the fun. It'd be a dream come true if I could get a full-time ride on the Grand National Circuit, he said on March 26, 1981. That's the ambition of anybody that races seriously. Maybe someday the right door will open. In 1981, the year Jess Potter died, Mike did run for another team. This wasn't entirely by choice. NASCAR's mandatory reduction to a 110-inch wheelbase made his own car out of date, and the needed upgrades on his mount wouldn't be completed for the first few months of the season. Instead, Mike became the fifth driver to drive for Roger Hamby in the season's first eight races. He finished 35th at Darlington, black flagged off the track after just 17 laps, but in May earned a new career best of 15th at the Nashville Fairgrounds. Grand National Racing is a money game, and Roger can't afford to have a driver go out trying to make a good show and fall out early, said Mike. He wants his car to finish, run all day. If he can afford to take a chance, his car is capable of finishing in the top seven. But in the money game of racing, he has to have consistency. One such incident did occur at Talladega that August, where Mike tangled with Dale Earnhardt on Pitt Road, taking the number three out of contention. After a couple more starts for Hamby in 1982, Mike returned to team ownership in 83 for his first bid at the Daytona 500. Just $5,000 in sponsorship money was just enough to buy used motor parts from Dieguard and Harry Rainier. His number 76 Cam Farm Oldsmobile missed the race, finishing 33rd of 35 starters in race number one of the Uno Twin 125 mile qualifiers. Then he ran 7th of 14 in the consolation race, which if he won, would have transferred him into the 500 as well. He'd go on to start 11 races that year, most he'd ever run in a single season. Half of this schedule came driving for Bud Reeder, who like Roger Hamby frequently swapped drivers in his number 02. From there, Mike Potter remained an infrequent competitor in NASCAR's top series. From 1984 through 1990, he started just 21 of those 232 races. Invariably, he drove for owner-drivers who were looking for other drivers to take the wheel. Jimmy Walker, Elmo Langley, Chet Phillip, Charlie Baker, Buddy Arrington, and Bobby Waywick. By the end of his career, Mike would make more cup starts at Darlington than any other, 10 in total. This attracted sponsorship from O.C. Welch, Ford Lincoln Mercury, a South Carolina dealership that's still in business today. On September 1st, 1985, when Bill Elliott won the Winston Million, Mike climbed from last on the grid to finish 28th. This occurred after a freak incident in final practice where an oil leak started a fire and a faulty fire extinguisher unleashed a cloud of chemicals big enough to stop the session. The car, however, needed only a brief cleaning before it was ready for the race, and Mike was also ready to go. In the same race two years later, however, Mike spun after second place Davey Allison cut a tire on lap 165. An instant later, Mike was struck by Benny Parsons and fourth place Lake Speed, eliminating all three drivers. I saw Lake and the 81 car get together, said Parsons after the incident. I couldn't get to the left of them, and then they went up the track. My only hope was that they wouldn't be there when I got there, but boy did I nail him, referring to Potter. That's the best I've run this year, but all I get is a sore wrist and tailbone, which I'm going to have x-rayed on Monday. In 1988, Mike made his second attempt to qualify for the Daytona 500, his first in five years. He wasn't originally on the grid for the first 125-mile qualifier until Rodney Combs wrecked his Oldsmobile in practice, opening a place for his number 64 Chevrolet. Potter climbed to 26th in the field of 35, still well short of a spot in the field. He tried again in 1990, expanding on an ARCA ride with Thee Dixon, 
who years later would field cars for Carl Long. An early crash left Potter 38th in the ARCA 200, and ignition problems prevented him from turning a lap in cup qualifying. Potter was still able to start his 125, where he finished 24th of 30 drivers out of the 500 field once more. Coming into the 1992 season, Mike Potter hadn't made a single cup start in more than a year, having failed to make his only attempt at Charlotte in 91. But much like Andy Belmont was told coming into the season, NASCAR was experiencing a lean year in terms of car counts, which promised to give underfunded drivers a chance to compete during Richard Petty's fan appreciation tour. As it happened, Mike had joined forces with Steve Below, owner of Canova Golf Course Construction in West Palm Beach, Florida. Below would be the listed owner of Potter's new ride, the number 77 Chevrolet, with Canova itself as sponsor. New, however, isn't really the best word. The car was, in fact, the same chassis Mike had been running as an owner-driver as far back as 1983. It was also the same car that was wrecked in the ARCA 200 two years earlier, pieced together after $25,000 of repairs. I've always been the type of racer who worked until he had just enough money to go out and race, said Mike that year. My racing budget came out of my meal budget, so I'd race for a while, eat for a while, race for a while, eat for a while. I've never really saved up until I could get enough money to get really good equipment. With this car, I did. With 58 drivers set to battle for a spot in the 42-car field, Mike needed a fast lap. But after two rounds of qualifying, he still ranked just 46th with the fourth slowest speed in the combined sessions. This placed him 23rd on the 29-car grid for the first 125-mile qualifier, just the fourth Daytona 500 he'd ever attempted. He didn't have the slowest car, but he still had a lot of ground to make up if he was going to make the big race. <laughs> In the early laps, Mike was running near the tail end of the field when trouble broke out off turn four. Directly behind him, Kowicki gets turned around, Petty gets through, but bang! Terry Labonte takes it on the chin, as does Hot Strickland, Richard Petty, Dave Mader, Ben Hess, Rick Wilson, and finally, A.J. Foyt. Just like that, seven top drivers were eliminated, including eventual series champion Alan Kowicki. Then on lap 19, Dale Earnhardt found pole sitter Sterling Marlin. This has come off the fourth turn right there. Looks like Dale got right up by the back of the 22 car, and there's question from the radio talk. Did he get a little loose and lift, or did Dale get into him? It's hard to tell from that angle. Marlin parked his car to save it for Sunday, and when Wally Dallenbach Jr. lost an engine, there were already nine cars out of the race. Incredibly, the chaos still wasn't over. And then Kyle Petty. Dale Jarrett gets loose, spins around, and this time, Kyle Petty does not duck the bullet. For Kyle and for Jarrett, it's a long, grinding ride to the back of the 500 field. With now just 36 of the qualifier's 50 laps complete, the field had been whittled down to just 18 cars running, and only 16 of them on the lead lap. With everyone needing only a 14th place finish to lock into the 500 field, there was a good chance that simply finishing the race would be enough. Recall in Andy Belmont's episode of Rise of the Field Fillers that Belmont was drafting with Hutt Strickland in the final laps and passed him, thinking he'd made the race. The crew mistakenly thought that doing this pass would be enough to make the show, not taking into account Marlin's spin. As it turns out, the error was far worse. Following his involvement in the Kawiki wreck, Strickland was already four laps down, meaning the lead lap Belmont didn't gain any spots by passing him. Belmont was instead running 16th, needing to pass not one, but two more cars to make the show. In the run to the checkers, Belmont lost a lap in 16th, followed by 15th place runner Brad Teague. But the leaders couldn't catch the car running 14th, the last car on the lead lap, Mike Potter. Finally, for the first time in his career, Potter was going to start the great American race. In row 15, Mike Potter in Alabama's Stanley Smith. Potter was among several underdogs to make the field for the 500 thanks to the chaos of the first qualifier. Joining him would be Kerry Teague, who climbed from 27th to finish 10th in the patriotic Team USA Oldsmobile he entered under his own name. Phil Barkdahl climbed from 24th to 12th, securing his fifth and final 500 start. And rolling off 27th, having marched from last on the grid to 13th, Del McCowart was in the Daytona 500 for the first time since 1985. The second qualifying race ran much cleaner, featuring only one caution for Mark Gibson's spin. 
The underdogs in that race, like Mike Skinner, James Hilton, and Joe Boer, thus finished well down in the rankings, all of them out of the 500 field. One exception, ironically, was the race's only DNF. Bob Schacht timed in an impressive 18th in first round qualifying and pulled out with engine problems in the first seven laps. That same issue would ultimately rank him last in the 500. For us to be in the field for the 500 is already a victory, said Mike on Thursday. After our 125 miler, I felt like Daryl Waltrip when he did that victory dance in Victory Lane. It was very emotional. I ran my first Winston Cup race in 1979. I've been down here four times trying to qualify, but I never made it. Well, all the wives and girlfriends of our crew were all crying. The big race for us was the 125, Potter said on race morning. That was our high pressure race. Let's face it, the circumstances that occurred Thursday had to happen for us to make it. But we raced according to the rules and system, and this time the system worked to our advantage. I tell you one thing, people who never paid a whole lot of attention to Mike Potter have noticed me since Thursday. I've even spoke to a couple of people about sponsorship after this race. In the Daytona 500 itself, Potter finished 30th, out with a busted fuel pump in the final 50 laps, but still took home a valuable $21,710 towards his team's efforts. With it, Potter attempted 18 of the season's 29 races. He qualified for 11, including the 500, tying his season best mark from 1983. He hired a new pit crew for the Spring Atlanta race. Gary Hargett, the crew chief, previously led the crew of both Dale Earnhardt and Harry Gant. Together, Mike Potter's best run came at Pocono on June 14th, site of Alan Kowicki's final Cup Series win, where Potter took home 20th in a Buick. By season's end, Potter also made a few starts in the Grocery Getters, entered by Jimmy Means, making the race at Rockingham, and even attempting the famous Hooters 500. Part of Potter's effort was helped by Pete Lips, a friend of Mike's, who spread word of the number 77 team through letters to the editor of the Johnson City Press. Mike stayed single, chased that dream, and today is married to that Chevrolet Lumina, he said in 1992. Pete and his wife Teresa started a fan club to help spread the word. Mike joined forces with Henley Gray in 1993, but came up short of his second straight 500 start. He crashed his number 77 at Rockingham, then on March 28, 1993, the day of Alan Kowicki's final cup start, made his own 60th and final start. He turned just four laps in Jimmy Means' backup car before the number 53 pulled behind the wall with handling blows, similar to his run for Means the previous fall. But this was not the end of Potter's racing career. In 1999, Potter looked to compete in ARCA, attempting both races at Pocono. After back-to-back -back DNQs, he finally broke through in 2000 and finished 37th. At the time, Potter had made just two career starts in the NASCAR Xfinity Series and none since 1985, but he returned to the division on August 4, 2001 at IRP. There, he reunited with Jimmy Means, who gave him his last cup ride. Now focused on the second-tier series, Mike got Means' car into the 37th spot, sending two other cars home, and finished the race in 41st. He continued to drive for Means through 2003, then raced for Johnny Davis, as late as 2008. His most recent start came on June 28th of that year, when he finished 29th in a race won by Tony Stewart. Like its driver, the 1983 chassis that Mike raced into the 1992 Daytona 500 has also remained active. By 2014, it was converted to run in the Super Cup Stock Car Series. The veteran driver brings a car with a good amount of history, read an article on the series webpage. Mike Blevins, a friend of Mike's, restored the car to its original 1992 Chevrolet Lumina body and Canova paint scheme. While his cup career was brief, Mike Potter's passion for racing remains. My dad never had any money when he was racing. I guess like father, like son, said Mike. I never had any money either, and I ran 60 Winston Cup races. I guess I got my daddy's determination. In February 2017, Mike accepted the Red Vote Mechanic and Engineering Award on behalf of his late father. Mike continued to compete actively in the Super Cup Stock Car Series through just last year, campaigning the number 14. This year, Mike has scaled back on driving, at least in a race car. Earlier this year, he reunited with Johnny Davis to drive one of the team's Xfinity haulers. As of this writing, health issues have kept Mike away from the track, but the stories remain. For his entire career, Mike Potter competed for the love of the sport, 
who surrounded himself with others who shared that passion. And like many other independents in his position, the racing gods rewarded him with one supreme accomplishment in his qualifying for the Daytona 500. His fortitude reminds us that with each green flag comes the opportunity to have the race of your life. Thank you for checking out this video, and by all means leave a comment down below and check out my channel for other content much like this. I'd like to thank Thomas Williams who reached out to me about this project and provided some great content, and to Brian Hallman who again at the BRH Racing Archives provided some excellent photography for this project. And to Mike, I hope you enjoyed it. In America, there exists a sport that is driven by the fans. They are why everyone works so hard. On the teams and at the tracks, in front of the grandstands and behind the scenes, to give the fans the greatest race possible. NASCAR fans deserve the best, starting from the high banks of Daytona, all the way to the shores of California, and at every race in between. NASCAR fans, you're the reason for our success. Thanks.